Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses the section of the book titled The Vector Space of Linear Maps. Recall that f denotes either the scalar field r of real numbers or the scalar field c of complex numbers. Recall also that previously we let v denote a vector space over f. We continue with that convention, but now we will need a second vector space, which we will call w. Thus, v and w from now on will always denote vector spaces over f. They need to be vector spaces over the same choice of f. Thus, v and w are both either real vector spaces, or v and w are both complex vector spaces. Recall that if m is a positive integer, then p sub m of f denotes the vector space of polynomials with coefficients in f and degree less than or equal to m. For purpose of examples, we need one more vector space, p of f, which is the vector space of all polynomials with coefficients in f, no restriction on the degree. For each positive integer m, p sub m of f is a finite dimensional vector space. In contrast, p of f is an infinite dimensional vector space. We will soon use p of f in some examples. In previous videos, we've discussed vector spaces. Actually, the real interest in linear algebra is not so much on vector spaces, but on linear maps between vector spaces. Thus, we're now ready for that crucial definition. A linear map from a vector space v to a vector space w is a function from v to w that satisfies two properties. The first of these properties is called additivity. It says t applied to u1 plus u2 is equal to t of u1 plus t of u2, and this needs to hold for all vectors u1 and u2 in v. The second condition required to call a map linear is homogeneity, which says that t applied to lambda u is lambda times t of u for all scalars lambda and all vectors u. Note that when dealing with linear maps, we often use the notation t of u without the parentheses, as well as the more standard functional notation t of u with the parentheses. These two notations are interchangeable. Sometimes leaving out the parentheses makes things clearer. Sometimes the parentheses are needed for grouping. The set of all linear maps from v to w is denoted by L of v comma w. Let's look at some examples. The simplest linear map is called zero. This is the linear map from v to w that sends every vector u in v to the vector zero in w. We call this linear map zero, so this is yet another use of the symbol zero. Here we see the key equation zero applied to u is zero. The zero on the right is the zero vector in w, in other words, the additive identity in w. The zero on the left of this equation means the linear map from v to w that takes every vector in v to zero. Our next example is the identity map from v to v. This linear map takes every vector u in v to itself. Our next example is the differentiation linear map defined on the vector space of all polynomials with real coefficients mapping into the same vector space. We will denote this linear map by d for differentiation. d is defined by d of a polynomial p is equal to the derivative p prime. To verify that d is a linear map, we must verify the two properties of additivity and homogeneity. The additivity property is simply the property of derivatives, namely that the derivative of the sum of two functions is the sum of the derivatives. And the homogeneity condition is simply the result that the derivative of a constant times a function is the constant times the derivative of the function. Our next example is an integration linear map. This will be defined on the vector space of all polynomials with real coefficients into the vector space R of real numbers. We'll define it as follows. T of a polynomial P will be the integral from 0 to 1 of P. The verification that t is a linear map relies on properties of integrals, namely the integral of the sum of two functions is the sum of the integrals, and the integral of a constant times a function is equal to that constant times the integral of the function. 
Notice how properties from calculus about derivatives and integrals become intertwined with the idea of linearity. Our next example is a linear map from the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients to itself. We'll, we'll call this linear map t, thus we want t of p to be another polynomial. t of p evaluated at x will be x squared times p of x. Our next example is called the backward shift. It is defined from the vector space f infinity to itself. Recall that f infinity is the vector space of all sequences of elements of f. The backward shift is defined as follows. We start with the sequence x1, x2, x3. We chop off the first term x1, throw it away, and shift all the other terms one to the left. That's why it's called the backward shift. Our next example is a linear map from R3 to R2. It's defined by t of x, y, z is first coordinate 2x minus y plus 3z, second coordinate 7x plus 5y minus 6z. Obviously, there's nothing special about the numbers that appear in this example. They could be replaced by any numbers, or we could go from um, rn to rm for any integers m and n with similar examples. This slide shows a large number of examples of linear maps, but remember that not every function is linear. Anyone who's taught calculus has been frustrated when students will write something like cosine of x plus y equals cosine of x plus cosine of y. That equation is not true, but it's an example of how people want things to be linear. Our next result is an easy but very useful theorem. It says the following. Suppose we have a basis v1 up to vn of v and any vectors w1 up to wn of w. Notice we have the same number of v's as w's. The conclusion is there's a unique linear map t from v to w such that t of vj is equal to wj for each j. For this theorem, notice that the list of vectors v1 up to vn in v needs to be a basis but the list of vectors w1 up to wn in w does not need to be a basis. It's an arbitrary list of vectors. They could all be zero, they could all be the same, or it might happen that they form a basis of w. Let's look at the idea of the proof of this theorem. Because v1 up to vn is a basis of v, every vector in v can be written in a unique way as a linear combination of v1 up to vn. In other words, we can write any vector v as some constant c1 times v1 plus another constant c2 times v2 up to plus another constant cn times vn. We define t of that linear combination to be c1 w1 plus etc. up to cn wn. It's easy to check that with this definition of t, t is linear. And furthermore, t of each vj is equal to wj because to define t of vj, we look at the linear combination where we take the coefficient cj to be 1 and all the other c's to be 0. The function t shown here is the only linear map from v to w such that t of vj is equal to wj for each j. This definition is forced upon us by the conditions of additivity and homogeneity. Now we want to define an addition and a scalar multiplication on the set L of V comma W, which is the set of linear maps from V to W. We do that in the obvious way. Specifically, if S and T are linear maps from V to W, then we define S plus T to be the function from V to W whose value at U is S of U plus T of U. Furthermore, if lambda is a constant, we define lambda T to be the function from v to w whose value at u is lambda times t of u. With these definitions, it's easy to verify that s plus t and lambda t are both linear maps from v to w. It should not be a surprise to you that with these definitions of addition and scalar multiplication, L of v comma w becomes a vector space. Thus, we have a whole new class of examples of vector spaces. 
Now we come to another important algebraic operation with linear maps, namely taking the product. For this we need three vector spaces, which we'll call u, v, and w. If t is a linear map from u to v, and s is a linear map from v to w, then the product st will be a linear map from u to w that's defined simply as the composition of s and t. In other words, the product st evaluated at u is equal to s of t of u. You should verify that this is indeed a linear map. Here are the key algebraic properties of products of linear maps. First we have associativity, which means grouping does not matter and we can ignore parentheses. This involves three linear maps. We haven't stated it here explicitly, but this equation is valid only if the ranges and domains are such that these compositions make sense. Our second property is the identity. t times i is equal to i times t is equal to t. Recall that i denotes the identity map. However, the two i's here are not necessarily the same. Let's assume that t is a linear map from u to v. Then the i in the left-hand equation is the identity from u to u, whereas the i in the center equation is the identity map from v to v. The third key property of products of linear maps are the distributive properties, which you see here. Again, for this to make sense, the domains and ranges have to be appropriate. Notice that there are two distributive properties, rather than one. The reason for two is that the product of linear maps, unlike the sum of linear maps, is not commutative. In other words, s times t does not necessarily equal t times s. Linear maps take zero to zero. Specifically, suppose t is a linear map from v to w, then t of zero is equal to zero. The zero on the left side of this equation is the additive identity in v, and the zero on the right side is the additive identity in w. This result is easy to prove. Let's look at the proof. We have t of zero is equal to t of zero plus zero, because zero plus zero equals zero. Now by the additivity property of t, that's equal to t of zero plus t of zero. Now add the additive inverse of t of zero to each side of this equation, to conclude that zero is equal to t of zero, as desired. To conclude this video, I want to point out that the term linear map has a slightly different meaning in calculus than in the theory of vector spaces. If we think of a function f defined from the real line to the real line, with f of x equal mx plus b, in calculus that function is considered to be a linear map regardless of the values of m and b. However, if we think of R as a one-dimensional vector space, and again define f of x equal mx plus b, then it's easy to see that that function f is linear in the sense of linear maps on vector spaces if and only if b is equal to zero. In other words, f of x is equal to mx is a linear map, but f of x equals mx plus four is not a linear map. For f to be linear in the sense of vector spaces, we must have f of zero equals zero. But if f of x equals mx plus 4, then f of 0 equals 4, and thus that particular f is not linear in the sense of vector spaces. This concludes the video on the vector space of linear maps.